You guys ready for some plant science? Because I'm not. Today we got David Reeves here with a video in his series, Why You Should Believe in Creation and Not Evolution, Photosynthesis. All right, it's time to roll. Why should you believe in creation and not evolution? I mean, scientifically speaking. Probably because it's kind of true, scientifically speaking. Haven't we proven that evolution is a fact? Yes. Well, when most people think of evolution, they think of the supposed process where over millions of years, small changes in a species have added up to big changes between species. Nah, fam. I think of a squirtle becoming a blastoise. These small changes have supposedly given rise to every organism and system that we see today, from oak trees to squirrels to our nervous system. Great, yes, and I should probably stop cutting to myself so often. But how could a random chance process result in the incredibly complex organisms and systems that we see today? Complex what? Complex has almost no meaning unless you compare it to something else. Organisms millions of years in the future will be more complex than organisms today. Organisms today are more complex than organisms in the past. And this is actually demonstrated in the fossil record. The further back we go, the less complex the organisms tend to be. Let's look at just one small part of one kingdom, photosynthesis in plants. In one kingdom? Photosynthesis is found in many kingdoms, bro. Photosynthesis is the process by which plants turn sunlight into energy. Well, it's not only done by plants, and plants can turn sunlight into chemical energy, usually a sugar, and this sugar isn't directly usable yet. The process of turning sugar into energy is respiration. Plants go through aerobic respiration. That's right, plants also use oxygen, in the same way we do. If they didn't have this amazing ability, all of the energy coming to us from the sun would be useless. Considering that living organisms on Earth capture so little of the grand total of the energy emitted by the sun, most of it was useless anyway. And life would be impossible. No, 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 no. Life would not be impossible. In fact, the first life on Earth did not use photosynthesis. They were prokaryo-like organisms that oxidized inorganic compounds for energy. You think all living organisms only used sugar? Ridiculous. In fact, oxidizing things is a pretty good way of obtaining energy. That's why when sugar passes through any metabolic process, it gets oxidized. So as long as there's something that is somewhat reduced, there's energy to be obtained, hypothetically. So here's how it works. You guys ready to learn some science from a creationist? Leaves are composed of many different layers. An outer waxy layer called the cuticle protects the leaf. Oh my god, he got something right! But it's also to prevent excess transpiration, giving the plant some sort of control over its water content. A layer of clear flat cells called the epidermis allows sunlight in, but not out. No, not really. The epidermis has a variety of functions, such as protecting against water loss, regulating gas exchange, etc. But only allowing sunlight to pass through one direction isn't exactly one of its functions. And openings on the underside of the leaf, stomata, are guarded by cells that know which molecules to let in and which waste molecules to let out. That's actually 100% false. First of all, the cells you are talking about that surrounds the stomata are guard cells. These cells open and close in response to stimuli, specifically epsisic acid. When this hormone is released, it signals the influx of calcium and guard cells from the vacuoles, which in turn signal the opening of anion channels. Anions rush out due to the chemical force. As a result, the membrane depolarizes. Voltage-gated potassium channels then open after a certain potential is reached, and potassium flows out of the cell. Due to osmosis, water follows. The overall effect decreases the volume of the fluid inside the guard cells, which makes them flaccid and thus closing the stoma. The opposite happens when abscisic acid is absent. Hydrogen ions are actively pumped out of guard cells. This causes potassium to flow in due to the electrical force. Water follows due to osmosis. The overall effect increases the volume of the fluid inside the guard cells, which bloats up the cells and thus opening the stoma. And I just realized that you probably don't give a shit about the mechanism, so here's a TLDR. The opening and closing of the stomata are controlled by the guard cells, which are controlled by the plant. It doesn't know what to let in and out like you're claiming. The only thing it does know is when to open and close, which brings me to my second point. The stomata has absolutely no control on what's passing through it. Once it opens, anything's fair game. Oxygen, water, and CO2 generally pass through without any resistance, and this is actually very, very important for anyone who studies plant ecology. There's an entire field studied just because the plant cannot control what enters or leaves the stomata. For example, plants can be divided into a few classes based on the environment, C3, C4, and the Crassulation Acid Metabolism Plants, or CAM for short. Let's look specifically at CAM plants today. There are plants that live specifically in the desert where water is scarce. They have to preserve as much water as possible in order to, you know, survive. 
But this creates a tug of war between water preservation and photosynthesis. Basically, plants need to open their stomata in order to obtain CO2. This creates a problem for plants living in dry areas. If you open your stomata, you will get carbon dioxide, but will lose too much water as transpiration. If you close your stomata, you will preserve plenty of water, but there will be a lack of CO2. Of course, the camp plants have a few solutions to this, one of which involves an alternate primary carboxylation enzyme, just like the C4 plants, called PEP carboxylase. This, along with some other properties such as the modification of carbon dioxide levels and oxygen levels in the bundle sheath cells, allow the plant not to open its stomata as much and still have the same efficiency of photosynthesis. CAM plants are also unique in that it can store its organic acid products in vacuoles for later use during the day. I won't go into details since I went a little bit too much in detail earlier and I don't think anyone is really interested. So in short, there are specific biochemical adaptations that C4 and CAM plants undergo in order to survive in dry areas. If stomata were able to choose what passes through it, then this entire adaptation would not exist. The fact that cam plants such as pineapples or cactuses exist disproves your point, David. Okay, so Berkeley's resource repository, called Understanding Evolution, speaks of these stomata. Do they provide evidence for the evolution of the stoma? <laughs> Not quite. Instead, they point to a supposedly 180 million year old fossil of a leaf with, guess what? Fully formed stomata. Stomata is not hard to develop, it's just fucking holes with two cells surrounding it. It's no surprise that plants in the past would have it. It was more of a response to the formation of the cuticle which limited transpiration and gas exchange. So jumping inside a cell in the leaf, we'll find chloroplasts. These little machines convert sunlight into chemical energy to make sugar. They do this because they contain chlorophyll, a tiny complex molecule made of many different atoms that's responsible for a plant's green color. Chlorophyll plays a role, but you're making it seem as if it's like the most important part. Could it be that you just don't understand it enough to name anything else? Alright man, spill the beans, who wrote your fucking script? The atoms that make up chlorophyll fall into just the right sequence and fold in just the right way to be able to respond to incoming light. Yo fuck! I hate it when you creationists say that things are set up in just the right way as if that makes any fucking sense, because it doesn't. Everything is properly explained by natural selection. We could have had this work in multiple different ways, it just so happened that this one came out on top. And then you question how perfect it is? Sure, it seems perfect, but any alternative would have also been perfect. For example, certain members of proteobacteria has a pigment called bacterial chlorophyll that makes the bacteria purple. It uses this compound to perform photosynthesis. Is that design, David? Is it? Now light is useless on its own. It has to be changed into chemical energy and then sugar. Chlorophyll spits out energized electrons, which are essentially pressed into batteries. Now these are used as energy packets to grab carbon dioxide from the air. Then this CO2 is bound into starch and sugar. Motherfucker, when was the last time you even said something correctly? The light dependent reaction in the photosystems don't work like that. I'm not going to go into detail because that's kind of pointless, but basically electrons are excited at a wavelength of 680 nanometers at photosystem 2, where it then travels to a whole bunch of electron carriers until it reaches photosystem 1. Then, if you're talking about the non-cyclic pathway, the electron is excited again at wavelength 700 nanometers, where it eventually is collected by NADP plus to form NADPH. This process also pumps protons across a semi-permeable membrane, but that's not the focus here. The NADPH then goes to power the Calvin cycle. CO2 is not collected by the electron itself, but rather by the enzyme Rubisco in C3 plants and PEP carboxylase in C4 and CAM plants. So David, please, if you're going to give an example of a system that supposedly proves creation, at least choose one that you actually understand. Of course, this is just a very simple view of the incredibly complex system of photosynthesis. Very simple indeed. So simple that most of what you said is wrong. And there are many more parts that have to all work together in perfect harmony to make this function. If one step in the process doesn't work or one enzyme isn't quite right, then the plant is unable to use sunlight to make energy. And making chlorophyll alone takes 17 enzymes. <laughs> That's it, I'm gonna lose it! <laughs> so where did such an incredibly complex system come from? There's no way it came from slow, gradual changes over millions of years. Actually, it can, because photosynthesis in the past was very simple. It didn't involve so many steps. The process became more and more complex as life went on. After all, if all of the parts aren't in place at the same time, the process just doesn't work. 
Irreducible complexity is complete bullshit. Look, we even have modern organisms today that perform photosynthesis in a more simple manner than plants. They don't have all the shit like stomata, 15 different electron transporters, or organelles that perform photosynthesis. In fact, plants are actually unique. Most organisms that perform photosynthesis do not release oxygen as a byproduct because they use different reducing agents. For example, let's look at the purple bacteria I mentioned earlier that has bacteria chlorophyll. These bad boys are kind of similar to earlier organisms that performed photosynthesis. What happens is that instead of going into a Calvin cycle to produce sugar, they use the excited electrons to pump hydrogen ions across to build a proton gradient. This proton gradient then goes through an ATP synthase to produce ATP. This is a very simple system, and then over time, these organisms that had these systems would eventually become more complex and more complex until they had the system that plants have today. It's not rocket science, you just need to actually understand it. And why would it be selected for by natural selection? Half of the enzymes to make chlorophyll won't do the plant any good. Maybe it's because you don't understand evolution. Genesis gives us an origin of this incredible process when it says that God calls the land to bring forth grass and seeds and plants and trees. So if God is the author of this process, then we don't need blind chance over millions of years. Yeah, why spend years studying reality when you can just feed your ignorance through a stupid book? Yes, I have faith that God is the author of photosynthesis. But the alternative is to say that 17 enzymes, dozens of complex processes, the sun and water and everything else just happens to work well together. Alright, well, he has no more new arguments to bring up, so I'm just gonna end the video here. I know I rambled too much about the science of everything, but I wanted to let the creationists know who they're up against. Like, you can't just make these ignorant claims and then get all the basic information wrong. That's not how it works. If you're gonna make an argument, especially one that involves science, at least understand the topic you're talking about. And with that, I'm out. Peace.